This is the Mind Get Set Game podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. And on today's show, I've got Sid Sharma. Uh, he's going to be partaking in a challenge across America with type 1 diabetes. So welcome to the show, Sid. Hi, James. Thanks for having me. So can you give a little bit more in-depth uh, story as to why you are taking this challenge up upon yourself? Yeah, so October 2015 is when I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and that's an autoimmune condition, and it can happen to anybody at any age, really. You can't really do much about it. And uh, since diagnosis, I thought I really need to get back into sports and be playing a lot of cricket beforehand. And once the doctor said to me, you know, now you've got type 1 diabetes, forget about playing sports, just go out for walks. And that kind of triggered something in me saying, uh, you know, how can you tell that I can't play any more sports? So I signed up for a bike ride from London to Paris for Diabetes UK uh, last year. And at the time, I didn't have a bicycle. I was very weak from my diagnosis and all the all that happened before that. And so I used that as a vehicle to keep myself uh, engaged with something else and not get depressed really about mm -hmm. having type 1 diabetes and all the challenges that comes with learning how to manage your condition 24-7, 365 days a year. And uh, the fact that we don't have a cure for it right now, it, it, it is kind of uh, hard mentally to figure out how you want to leave your, uh, lead your life after that so, and diagnosis really. And uh, after I did the London to Paris bike ride beyond type 1, which is a California-based global charity, uh, they got in touch with me saying, uh, hey, Sid, we are doing this uh, Cross America bike ride uh, as a documentary uh, next year. Would you be interested in signing up? And, uh, you know, I, I have a philosophy of no regrets. And I thought in 10 years time, will I say, oh, no, why did I not go and do that event? I should have. So I thought, OK, let's let's sign up. And to be honest, since then, uh, it's been amazing how much my life has changed already just by signing up for it in terms of training, preparation, education, uh, getting to know my teammates now who are from all over the world, really. And, uh, and, and, and also what we are just about to do, you know, cycling from New York to San Francisco for a normal person can be a bit of a challenge, but to manage yourself, your teammates, uh, because, uh, we will have a camera crew as well shooting us for 10 weeks. And, uh, and none of us are used to those kind of things, really. And so to be in that bubble of doing something like that with people who know exactly what you're going through, uh, you know, was was everything that I was hoping for a challenge. But it's a slight jump from a 300 mile bike ride to Paris to 4,300 mm. across America. So yes. Yeah. And what what kind of the some of the uh, upheavals that you think you're going to face along the way, or have you kind of cross some of those with talking to your um, other peers, so to speak? Uh, well, none of us has ever done anything like this before, apart from one of my team members who has done like a Cross America bike ride with other groups, and he was the only type 1 diabetic with them. But for all of us, you know, we only signed up for this sometime in December last year, so we haven't had forever to train for it. Uh, none of us are pro athletes. All of us have had diabetes for much longer than I have had it. So mine has been only 18 months, but within the team, we have about 260 odd years of type 1 diabetes experience and a good mix of male and female uh, diabetics and ranging from a 17-year-old girl to somebody who's in their 50s. So it's it's a wide mix of people uh, and, uh, and, and that will bring its own challenges, whether you're talking about training right now, uh, whether you're talking about the heat in the US. So as you know, in Wales and England right now, the summer is here, but it is still very, very cold. Uh, so, you know, how do I train for some event, which is going to be mostly 35, 40 degrees Celsius every day. So hydration, nutrition, recovery, uh, to keep ourselves motivated every day to keep turning that pedal, you know, 70 mile a day average cycling is what we'll be doing. We have some off days and some van days where we will be sort of getting some breaks in the middle. But to do all of that and manage our type 1 diabetes and shoot that documentary and hopefully motivate some people along the way, those are all challenges that will make this journey something memorable. And, uh, and, and I think we will all see each other through it. But uh, 
just to understand your own body is such a massive challenge for a normal person. And and, and I think what this has done is once the goal is set, uh, it's like, you know, you've probably been through that in, in terms of Olympic cycles. You know you have to peak in four years' time at that game. And so you want to slowly and incrementally improve, but you don't want to peak too early and, 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 and understand about your team, your coaches and everything else and, 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 and how your body is behaving. And so I'm kind of going through that self-exploration journey at the moment uh, because I am so new to type 1 diabetes. I am so new to what I'm doing. And all I do is experiment on myself, see how things are going, change, adapt, experiment again, and, and, and try and find my own balance. I always say, uh, you know, type 1 diabetes is a lot like uh, cycling. You have to find your own cadence. And all of us have our own cadence, so I think I think that's that's the big challenge here. So, in terms of the preparing for the heat, how have you gone about trying to be able to replicate it to a certain extent? Because, like you said, you said uh, that it's a some well summer months, so to speak, in in this country. I, I think to some degree we might have already had it <laughs> with that the, the sun. The sun uh, we had a couple of weeks ago. That might be the summer. So how how have you been able to kind of prepare yourself for the heat? Do you have any aid from, say, universities or something like that? Not really. All I've done is uh, put a blower heater next to my uh, turbo trainer and just sit on it and just sweat it out. But the problem is uh, what I've learned from those days is, yes, you sweat quite a lot. You drink water to hydrate yourself up. But... The, how the body behaves on the road when you have the wind and the traffic and, and the incline and everything else, the blood profile that I, sh- that I see is very different on a turbo trainer to what's actually on the road. So yes, I've tried doing some high heat uh, turbo training sessions to just see how much I'm sweating and how much I need to drink, but I don't think that is representative of what might happen on the road, uh, especially you know as we do because it's an endurance event, it's, it's not a race. And so all our bodies will be changing every day for 60 odd days. And so how do you compensate? How do you know what you need to work on? And if you don't forget, or, or if you forget to recover one day, it might come back and bite you four days down the line. Mm. So you have to have a plan. Yes, plans change, but you have to have some sort of a rough idea of how you would play your day out. And if something doesn't happen from nutrition to your recovery drink to, you know, somebody providing dinner, uh, where, wherever we are going, we have hosts in the local community and we don't know really exactly what we're going to be getting. So from a nutrition perspective, right now I'm controlling everything in my kitchen, which is great. But on the event, I have no clue. We might be getting amazing food, but there might be days where we might have to go and do our own grocery shopping and do something on our own. So again, I see that as a positive in terms of pushing myself. But, uh, but yeah, I, I posted on my private Facebook group uh, yesterday that some of the things I've learned from the endurance testing I'm doing in this week and next week is that I can't replicate 40 degrees Celsius training in England, full stop. Yeah, so I'm not going to even try. So that's an unknown. I'm happy to leave it as an unknown. Well, I think the only way you'd be able to replicate it would be in a... Um... Oh god, what's the word I want? A climate ch- climate ch- chamber. Yeah, I mean, uh, if Loughborough University or some places like that who have those kind of facilities uh, uh, would uh, would be interested, then then yeah, I mean, you can you can do some uh, testing. And and the good thing about type one diabetes is you can map, you can measure your blood sugars, you can measure measure your heart rate with a heart rate monitor, and so there are parameters that you can actually measure and see how your body is behaving in that heat. So it's not all guess and and, and thinking ah, approximately this much. No, you know exactly what your blood sugars are, and 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 if you have scientific help in measuring some of your other factors like uh, how much you're sweating and, and and what your muscles are behaving like, I think that might help. But I don't have the luxury of those kind of facilities really. So I'm just experimenting here as much as I can on my own. So in terms of hydration, Sid. Mm-hmm. Do you do um, testing like, uh, what was it, the u- urinary test, as in to see what spectrum you f- you kind of fall upon with, with your hydration? Yeah, I mean, something as basic as that, really, uh, in terms of also how many hours I'm going to be riding on, on a particular day, what's the weather like, 
uh, how many bottles do I need to carry? Do I need to put some electrolytes in them or not? Or am I happy just drinking water? And uh, and and different days throw different challenges. And again, I don't have a water stop where water is waiting for me. Mm. Sometimes when I go on a longer bike ride, I make sure there's a shop in the middle where I can just sneak in, buy a one-pound water bottle, two-liter water bottle, and fill my bottles back up again because I'm consuming more water. So it's things like that, really, which... Uh, uh, which are interesting, but also make it a bigger challenge than what somebody might perceive at face value. Is uh, is is oh yeah, you're just cycling, uh, but uh, but yeah, what you have to do to prepare for something like this is quite methodolo- methodological. And so, being an engineer and somebody who has done some data analytics courses, I understand numbers. I can work with them. So all I am doing every day is just collecting data points, plotting graphs, seeing what's happening to my body, see how I'm feeling. And hopefully when I come back from the U.S., I will have enough days worth of research to hopefully share with uh, people uh, or through a PDF or through a website or something like that. Uh, just so that other people who are type 1 diabetic or want to do something endurance based, uh, they might get some information out of that. So if we come back a little bit to the beginning where you said, um, when your doctor said you should forget about exercise, uh-huh. what kind of mental state did that put you in? Well, I was in tears, really, <laughs> because I was like, how can you say that? Because from, from the day I can remember from my childhood, I've always been interested in sports. I've played cricket. Uh, I've played cricket at my university here in Coventry. I've played a lot of league cricket in Birmingham district in, in, in the local Huddersfield League here in the Oxfordshire League and so sports has been pretty much a big part of my life and for somebody to then say yeah well done now you've got type 1 diabetes forget about it it was a massive hit and and but I kind of took it as that's one person's view mm. and so I need to go back and, and read and research and I think that's where in today's day and age, we have social media, we have access to information. Sometimes maybe it's a bit too much information, but if you can find the right person, and and, and one thing about the type 1 diabetes community is that so far, everybody who I've approached for information or knowledge have been very welcoming and they have shared more than I expected them to. So learning of other people's experience, and so I've, for the last 18 months, I've been like a sponge. If you've got... Anything doesn't matter what your age is, right? Somebody might be younger than me, but they have diabetes for longer than I've had. You have more experience than I do, technically. So I will learn from you. I'll ask you questions because, again, everybody is different. You know, one tip from my friend in Wales is very different to a tip from my friends in the U.S. And it's just trying it out and seeing, will that work for me? Will that not work for me? And then see how things go. So, I mean, in manufacturing, we use a circle called Plan, Do, Check, Act. And, 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 and that's kind of what I follow is make a plan, do it, check all your numbers and see how you're feeling about it and, and act as in if it's working, keep on doing it. If it's not, make some changes and go back again. So, again, for me, it's about listening to your body and uh, kind of following that uh, mindset. But I think, like you said with your doctor, it's, it's his one point of view. I think to a certain extent it's a little bit short-sighted because uh, if we use uh, one of the, one of the most successful British Oly- Olympians, uh, mm-hmm. Sir Steve Redgrave. Well, yep. for mo- uh, I'm gonna try and think off the top of my head. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many Olympics he did as a type one diabetic, but yep. you're saying, well, because you have type one diabetes, you can't do exercise. Well, that's somebody. De- well, I would say dealing with it. But overcoming their diabetes and, well, went on to become the greatest uh, British Olympian we had up until, uh, obviously, uh, Chris Hoy were going and surpassing it. But it's showing that what can be done. Okay, he, he obviously had uh, a lot a good support network behind him. Obviously, his, his wife is a doctor, so that's going to gonna help. Obviously, in elite sport, we've got... Uh, doctors, nutritionists, or also looking after the things. But kind of coming to my point there, it's, I think, reading his biography ooh, a couple of years ago, I think his was because, uh, obviously, with the sports such as rowing, they're having to consume so many calories 
day in day out it was the type of food he was actually intaking possibly had an effect at him getting diabetes as a, in a later life so if I come to that point how did you come to get your diabetes well I think again as I said type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition and 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 so you can't do anything when your pancreas stops to work mm. and we don't know what makes it stop producing insulin so type 2 and type 1 are very distinct kind of diabetes and 90% of the people who are type 1 diabetic in the, or diabetic in the world are type 2 diabetics and only 10% are type 1 and it's a very small population but it's a very misunderstood population because of that and 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 i think uh, stress might be to do something with it and if you can imagine Sir Stephen Redgrave you know the amount of intensity mm. of exercising the the stress and pressures of being a world class olympian i don't know what was his trigger but it is again for even for him it's an autoimmune condition but on sky you know when they don't have anything to show on sky sports channels they have like these 15 minute uh, documentaries on people and i saw his and his teammates were talking about how he would be left behind in their cycling drills how he would be lying on the floor after diagnosis because his stamina had just completely fallen off and just before i think the sydney olympics he was putting out numbers on the roar and and people were looking at him going wow thank god he's on our team you know and 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 and, and so if people like that and i know a lot of people who are not olympians but you know people next door who are doing stuff which is unthinkable triathlons ultra marathons i mean you name it and they have type 1 diabetes but they have learned to manage their condition it's not a condition that can consume you if you let it it is a manageable condition and again it all comes back to your own mindset and getting the right information if you are a positive person and if you want to do well you will find the resources find the people connect with them and and, and get it yes you were right i mean he had all the support from all the doctors and stuff but i mean so do i i just email randomly people saying hey i'm type 1 diabetic i've got this condition i'm about to do this challenge any tips and 70% of the time people come back saying hey have you tried this or have you tried that and 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 i think that helps so i think for me personally there is a a, a team called team blood glucose here in the uk and paul buchanan is the founder of that they have been incredibly helpful from a scientific standpoint trying to understand how a type 1 diabetic's body works and how to manage uh a multiple day event and how many carbs you should be eating how you should be recovering how much insulin you need to be taking and they have done some research on that and Paul was very open to sharing all of that information with me and that gave me the uh, you know I was talking about the plan do check act that mm. gave me the foundation for the planning phase saying okay if he's saying approximately this much yes again everybody's slightly different but if i have a ballpark to aim for and i can see how my blood sugars are behaving then i can change it to my own needs so uh, over the last week i've been going out nearly every day uh, cycling about 60 kilometers and doing about 800 meters of climbing every day and stopping every 5 kilometers so my fingers have been you know absolutely damaged because of all the finger pricking trying to do some blood tests but that's what i'm playing with is how my body behaved on day 1 i had to change my insulin again on day 2 i had to shift what i was eating on day 3 and 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 every day it's it's a change but i know roughly what i need to do and so the the next coming week is going to be a reinforcement of that week saying is it replicating again or is my body still changing further and so i need to keep that in mind so i mean you know people say ignorance is bliss but when it comes to something as serious as what mm. we about this summer the more knowledge you can get the better i think you are positioning yourself because you can't control a lot of things like in life about what's going to happen in this event but the ones that you can if you have some idea you are positioning yourself to succeed you may or may not do it eventually but you're positioning yourself in a much better position so i think i think for me that's that's very important is uh, is that getting that knowledge and having the hunger to learn about all these things because i feel to be honest i am an engineer by trade i feel like a doctor because i've been reading research paper talking to doctors and it's just learning a completely different way of being really but 
I want to do it, so I'm very happy doing it. Oh, but in terms of uh, like reading research papers, you're very accustomed to uh, the the terminology to a certain extent. Obviously, you're going to uni university. You know how a um, a journal is set up, so you can kind of understand it more so uh, than say somebody that likes to have something in layman's terms. So you've got the ins and outs of okay. The, what's a hypothesis abstract and kind of taking the information from that and being able to analyze it whereas I think in some circumstances I think this is where the media to some degree at times they kind of manipulate the data to kind of suit themselves so you'll see in the or I think it would have been when did I see this I think it was last week with what were they having a go at this time? I think it was salt content in in obviously supermarket foods and it had oh this is X amount times more than it should be than your recommended daily allowance. Yeah. Okay. What unit is that in? It's precisely, precisely. And 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 I think it's it, it, you raised a very important point and I think that's part of what I'm doing or trying to do on social media is uh, is try and put it in layman's term you know on places like Instagram I will say I am feeling like this these are my numbers this is what I ate this is what my graph looks like and and, and just talk about it like another fellow diabetic not like somebody who's an engineer who's reading research papers and can speak the lingo so to say and all the buzzwords because majority of the people don't understand those things and they say, yeah, that just went over my head. Can you just talk to me in plain English, please? And that is a challenge because, you know, I, ran, I very seldom find people who can talk in that kind of a way with numbers and with research and, 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 and backing. More people are influenced by somebody that they have seen uh, or heard of or, you know, read a small website article or a tweet. And, 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 and so <clears throat> that's, that, that's another thing I'm looking forward to is the more I live with type 1 diabetes, the more I experiment and push my body and myself to these challenges, hopefully I can then tell a story about this in a way where somebody new who doesn't even know type 1 language, let alone the research language, can understand and get the confidence that, hey, you know, I was diagnosed yesterday and I really want to go out for a walk and I can do that or I want to go and do a bit of swimming I can do that everybody chooses their own sports or ways in or ways to exercise or if I want to go and do a spin class yes go and do that but again how your body behaves is very different for different sports and I am sort of kind of working in cycling at the moment so my knowledge is going to be sort of in that space but again aerobic anaerobic exercises and what body parts you're using, and so on and so forth. I think again, it is it one size does not fit all really. And uh, and one thing I always tell people is write everything down that you're doing, and that usually helps because you can see patterns and you can see, uh, you know, if if you are a personal trainer and I come back and say, oh yeah, I haven't been feeling great for the last two weeks, and you say, okay, but what have you been doing? And I go, uh, maybe I did this or maybe I did that. Versus I put down a spreadsheet in front of you with everything that I've eaten. And, and, and what exercises I've been doing, you might get a better idea. You might be able to help me better because I am bringing that information to you. So I think it's 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 very, very, uh, like, keep it simple and do the basics rather than getting worried about the jargon and the buzzwords and anything else around it because type 1 diabetes is very complicated and uh, people who are diabetic usually don't go shouting about that but we have so many daily decisions to make about carb counting about taking insulin about measuring our blood sugars about everything else that we have to do like a normal person as well that it is very easy to get lost in all these decisions every day day after day it's relentless right we don't get a break on easter we don't get a break at christmas i don't get a two-week holiday away from type 1 diabetes it is coming with me everywhere and, and, and so that can be overwhelming. So I think keeping a simple strategy that works for you, and I, and I emphasize the word works for you, 
you know you don't have to open a spreadsheet but if a paper and pen works for you brilliant or if you want to write a new programming language and a new app that helps you do that you know on the other extreme because i'm not like that so again it's 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 about you and finding out what works for you so yeah so said in terms cuz we were talking about this a little bit off air about uh the tweet i put up Ooh, I'm going to say, I think it was about a week ago, uh, in terms of uh, the nutrition one and looking at uh, high fats, kind of diet, low carbs, mm-hmm. kind of, I won't say mentality, but can you kind of explain how your diet differentiates to say um, that of what is normally kind of custom as a, a low carb diet which is normally about what is it roughly to like kind of loot for somebody that's looking to lose weight it's about 40 percent protein 40 percent carb and 20 percent carb uh fats whereas you were saying yours is more yeah. predominantly higher in fats yeah so um i mean coming from india i eat uh, like standard curry is my daily food and so you've got non bread you've got rice you've got curries you know, very heavy carb based stuff. And so when I got uh, diagnosed, I was still eating that food. And at the time, I was taking up to five to six injections a day. And it was a roller coaster ride. Every time you eat, you're going up, then you're crashing, then you're going up, and then you're crashing. And it was very exhausting trying to live that way. And I was like, hang on a second, why is this so hard? And then I started reading up on it, and uh, uh, some somebody told me, hey, if you have a peanut allergy, nobody says have peanut three times a day and then inject for it. So if carbohydrates are having such a massive impact on your blood sugars, have you thought of maybe cutting them down or seeing what happens? And then again, as I said, I like to write things down. So instead of having three non-breads, I had two non-breads, then I had one non-bread, and I was thinking, hmm, I feel better. And my numbers are better as well. And, and and so I started learning more about it. There is a big book by Dr. Bernstein, who's been uh, diabetic for a very long time. And he has put his experiences down uh, around this. And, uh, and now I'm at a position where I was down to just one injection a day with an HbA1c, which is uh, your three-month blood sugar average, as good as a non-diabetic. And so for me, not having to inject myself six to seven times a day, not having to worry about going low or going too high. Uh, And again, trying to lead as normal a life as possible while going to work, doing sports and everything else that, you know, uh, I would want to do. So I saw a massive shift from a high carb diet to a low carb diet, uh, not just in my numbers, but in how I was feeling. So right now I'm in a state called nutritional ketosis where my ketones level could be anywhere between 0.5 mmol per liter, anywhere up to like 3 mmol per liter at the moment, because I am not strictly on a ketogenic diet. I do like my peanuts and other things (laughs) on the side. But I just feel better, and and, and that's why I'm doing it. And and I know a lot of people who are on a high-carb diet, and they are able to manage their insulin dosing and everything else in a way that works for them, and I can appreciate that because I see their numbers and they look brilliant. But for me, it was just easier being, you know, playing sports all my life, being disciplined. If I decide not to eat potatoes or decide not to eat bread, I can pretty much, you know, make a cut decisions from today onwards. I'm not doing this. For other people, it might be harder to say, oh, but I'm out with my friends. Oh, we're all having pizza. Oh, I don't want to eat salad. So I'll have that pizza. But I personally don't have that problem. If I don't want to eat something, I, I've got no problems in telling my friends or whoever, like, look, I just don't want to eat it. And so uh, because it was a positive vicious cycle, less injections, less fluctuations, feeling happier, eating better. And so a lot of the time I'm eating things like uh, different uh, cheeses, uh, coconut oil, olive oil, olives, lean meat, chicken, lamb, and uh, a lot of other standard food, really. Uh, it's just I have a lot more of the veggies and the curry and less on or nothing on the rice and non-bread side of things, really. So, uh, again, it has been an experiment. It hasn't been easy. But <clears throat> I feel that I am at a level now which is quite stable for myself. And 
hence i can take this challenge of cycling across america to the next level really by pushing myself now to do something completely different while trying to maintain this so again uh, going back to cycling your glycogen stores in your muscles are very important and so while i'm riding i i eat anywhere up to 40 to 60 grams of carbs an hour but i don't need any insulin for that because the intensity and my heart rate and how my body behaves it gets directly converted into glycogen stores so i am eating 60 grams of carbs an hour for a 4 hour bike ride my blood sugar stays stable they're not tanking down and if i get my insulin light right before it then it's a pretty normal bike ride i don't have to worry too much but i still have to check yes but it's not as stressful as it was before when i was just eating anything i did not know how insulin worked how long does it stay in your body how long does it take for a meal to go up and then come back down roughly about 4 hours you know to after 2 hours it usually peaks and things like that really and uh, and so for me it has worked i know a lot of people on either side of the argument uh, high carb low fat and low carb high fat and uh, and they have good pros and cons to both and i just happen to find my balance more on the low carb side than on the high carb side just because of the reasons i explained in terms of how my diabetes has become easier to manage because of that decision and so i don't miss out on food i eat like crazy but it's just my choices are different and i'm not putting on any weight anyway so it 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 just it is it, it's just working for me but again it might not work for the person next door and so all my experiments i say are n equal to 1 where i'm experimenting on myself and now i've got a few other people who have been following my journey on facebook and they are trying that and they are seeing similar results and they are going hey this is helpful said i've been diabetic for 20 odd years never realized i could do this and I'm like great if it's working for you while other people have tried it and it hasn't worked for them i said okay then you need to probably get better at carb counting and managing your insulin better to bring your blood sugars more in range so i have seen it work i've seen it not work but it to- it's totally dependent on your own uh, discipline around it really like any other sport or any activity in life if you want to do it you'll find the- you you'll not find the excuses really is uh, is what i want to say so it's a, it's a bit like um to some extent um macro counting like yes. that to, to that uh well to a certain extent probably the more how would i put it anal was and the bodybuilders measuring everything obviously they do that but there has been obviously research shown that flexible diet in actually measuring and uh, identifying like you said what you are actually eating will help you actually to manage your weight uh, lose weight to better than say uh what would it be um oh, what's the terminology for it like the ones who go for cheat meals so, more or yeah. less again it's it, it's like it's a way of life really and, and and that's how i try and explain to people it's 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 not a crash course for 6 weeks where you lose a ton of weight and then you go back to eating what you were doing it's 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 more of a lifestyle choice and the more regularly you do it it's not a fad diet or it's not like a slimming world crash course or something like that it you have you have embodied that in the in the way of of how your life is really you know uh, we all do with our sleep patterns with with how much we drive with how much we watch tv you know we we find our own own thing and so similarly with that really it's 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 kind of same oh it comes back to probably when you say fad diets is that's probably the person is looking at it the wrong way they're not actually delving deep enough as to what is the root cause to why they're not okay you'd be able to lose weight no matter what 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 quote unquote diet you're on be it uh low fat high carbs um and and so on because it is a res- it's a calorie calorie deficit that you're in so you're going to be eating less and expending more so you're going to lose weight so you could even do that with chocolate okay the precursor of doing that long term is yeah. is probably not very good but it's probably instilling within people habitual changes like you said it's it's kind of 
playing around with what works with you, taking taking something out. Oh, this this didn't quite work. So it's kind of like a little bit of scientific art, finding what works with you and kind of going from there. It's about investing in yourself, really. You know, there's that added saying, "Health is wealth," and I think until you lose it, like in my case with type one diabetes, you don't realize how important it is. And so uh, that's why I say, become a sponge of knowledge and 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 just read and and, and experience and experiment and and, and see see what works because <clears throat> the same recipe that I try works well with my stomach, but with my personal trainer, if I give him something, you know, he might say, "Oh, yeah, that didn't really sit well with me." And, and, and he might tweak it to suit his, uh, uh, you know, eating profile and, and, and what he does. And he comes up with something better. So I think it's, again, uh, don't be fixed in your mindset, you mm. know, and, and, and have the flexibility to be humble enough to ex- uh, listen to other people's opinion and, 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 and appreciate them and, and, and maybe try and sort of learn something that they might be doing specifically well and see if it works again. It's not a cutthroat, is it, that, oh, I have to do this. If it doesn't work for a week, you can always go back to what you were doing before that, but at least you know you tried. And and, and, and I think that's what I try and encourage any type 1 diabetic that I meet is uh, don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to experiment because that's the best way to learn rather than sitting and reading a 600-page book. It's much more fun experimenting, and you'll probably learn other things along the way as well. But I think, Sid... You you brought up that um, idle ad- ad- adage that people should listen to other people. I think I won't generalize, but I think we're in a kind of a fix now in society. Like people like to have conflict. They don't. Oh, this is what you say. Uh, I I don't agree with it. But in cases, well, if you don't try it, you you it 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 okay. You you might not agree with it. And it might not work, mm-hmm. but what have you got to lose when it comes when it comes to this big one of your health? It's exactly. I mean, there are two aspects to it, right? The width of knowledge versus the depth of knowledge. And I think there is a lot of width in terms of opinions and and stuff out there. But when you start digging deeper into the depths of it and what research has been done and who has funded that research and how many people was it researched on and what conclusions did it draw? I mean, it is mind-blowing to read some of the stuff around some of the medications that get prescribed and how little research there has been, in, even in terms of dietary guidelines and things like that. Uh, and, and, and so that usually baffles me. But again, if, if you make your opinion based on a tweet and not reading the research behind it, be, uh, then uh, then that's, that's a very slippery slope, really. And uh, I would always encourage people to you know, ask more, you know, as a kid, we used to always say, why this, why that, why this, why that, and I think as we grow older, we kind of forget to ask the question, why, and so, you know, the more whys you ask, probably you're going to figure out, even by asking those questions, whether it's, is it for you or not, because, uh, you know, you will pretty soon realize that, hey, that's a lot of work, or hmm, if he can do it, or she can do it, I can do it, and, 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 and then, so, again, <laughs> these things are so individualistic that people try and put everybody in one or the other box and mm. unfortunately they are all so different and I think embracing that ideology in itself is quite liberating because then you will never force your opinion on anybody else or never be forced upon by anybody else as well so I think uh, your mental state on how you look at these things is uh, is quite significant as well well, that's a definitely a valid point that you raised there, Sid. Because I think we, as a, to a certain extent, are kind of going... I don't know why that is. I, 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 I wouldn't say everybody... Uh, to how well, we could use that, that term, British terminology, like sheep. A lot of... I think it's very media-driven that they've got... I think more so in this country, they've generally got a an agenda versus against who is in power. So a lot of the quote unquote the British media is supposed to be impartial. A lot of the times you're thinking, well, you, you you're not because you you you're trying to have conflict, but then a lot of people kind of 
fixated on oh if this is what the news said it must be right whereas you should kind of reflect on things well well they haven't brought this up they haven't brought up that how if you but i think i think with media today they're trying to do it on purpose to divide people because you see oh it's kind of sidetracking a little bit here but you know with um documentaries with focusing on benefits so you're thinking okay some some people it's not their it's they're no fault of their own that they're in that predicament okay some people don't want to uh quote unquote better themselves to a certain extent they're quite happy being in that um social security bubble living off the state whereas you've got others that are but you having putting these documentaries out that are kind of demonizing the person you're thinking well it's not their fault possibly that they don't have a uh, vocation or a career because we are in that kind of mindset now where it's a uh, company driven environment they dictate who get, who gets interviews they don't have to uh reply to uh, correspondence where i think well this day and age with automated systems it's it's ridiculous it'll take you five seconds to put a code in now and it will send it to everybody and it's it's okay i i use those systems m myself so it, it kind of still gives that personal touch to the company is still replied to me and okay you may have not got the interview you may not got the job but you're getting that satisfaction that they are to say i don't say caring but they are going out out of their way to uh, actually respond to you which they in most cases most employers don't do anyway yeah i mean again it's it's about sensationalization right so a lot of the people just read the headline they don't even read the details in the article because our attention spans are so limited nowadays that people will see a fat flashy headline and and just react to that even without reading what's even in that small article let alone going into the details of it so uh, i think uh, it's a pretty weird world at the moment in terms of news and and, and social media and i think we're trying to find our balance in between too much information fake news and all these other stuff but uh, but yeah i think uh, you know, one day you might get an article saying coffee is great for you. The next day you get an article saying coffee is bad for your health. And so you go, okay, hang on a second. Which one do I listen to? You know, I'm not an expert. So I think trust plays a big role in that. You know, people, a lot of people trust this BBC or whoever the news channels are to to portray both sides of the picture. And they trust their doctor to give them certain medication and prescriptions. They trust their dietitian to guide them in the right way because that's what they have trained for, right? Why would I... Mr. Nobody should have an expertise in everything. I shouldn't. So, but that way people can be misled as well. Uh, it's uh, it's a fine line. Oh, but where that you raise a great point there at the end. If somebody says they know everything, it's it, they're probably a liar. A liar, because if you can't know everything, it's better to probably as I've seen other trainers put out there uh, in in the uh, quite recently. It's better to be forthcoming with a client, uh, somebody that's asking a question, and being truthful with that individual. Because it's you, you if you told a lie and say, "Oh, I know this, that, and the other," and you're proven to be that's false, the person is not going to trust you one bit. Whereas if you say to them, uh, "I don't know the answer to that question. Let me give me twenty four hours, forty eight hours to find out." Not only will the client or the person that's asked that question uh, gain a bit of knowledge, you will do as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that's a very good point. My my friend Simon Dooley, who helps me in the gym with setting up my programs and, and and things like that, he's a certified personal trainer. He's a cyclist as well, so he has a lot of knowledge in those areas, and he's absolutely brilliant at that. But when I went and we had a conversation about my cycling event, he said, "Look." Let, uh, you know, let's work together on this and get you to some level of reasonable fitness. He was the first person to say, look, I don't know anything about type 1 diabetes. I might learn from you along the way, 
but that's where you have to communicate with me as a personal trainer and tell me what's working, what's not working, while I can give you a program to go and try in the gym. And if something doesn't work, let's, you know, two-way communication in that kind of thing is very important. It can't be just one way and, and say, oh yeah, I know it all. You just are, you know, here and you're paying me for this, so you have to do this. No, I don't think it works that way. It, you have to listen to your client or who you're working with, body and their mind as well. And, and, and sort of tweak things around because if you say you are a know-it-all, you probably aren't really. So <laughs> we, we, we're all learning all the time. But I think you raise a good point there as well with the people that say do it my way or it's the highway. It's they, they're kind of set in this kind of tunnel vision uh, approach, so to speak. It's like, well, like you raised earlier on, everybody is very individualistic. If you gave uh, everybody a off-the-shelf program, Okay, to a certain extent, I think somebody raised this, 50% would probably see results, the other 50 would, would be, but you're treating those individuals as numbers then, which is kind of defeatist of the, kind of your, how would I put it, what your, your actual outset was going into the industry in in the first place because as a fitness somebody within the health profession shouldn't number one priorities uh not be not be not okay money is 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 good but shouldn't the priority be getting people healthy that they don't have to rely on on you they you you've got the knowledge i give you the knowledge to be able to do it by yourself obviously then you can help somebody else and it's kind of a springboard effect. Yes, I don't think a lot of people, unfortunately, think like that, and and, and that's 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 also a problem. But uh, but yeah, I mean, one size does not fit, fit all, and I can say that you know as long as I can live, really. And 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 that's why you have used the term personal trainer, right? The word personal is very important in that, and probably more important than the word trainer, because each each of us are different, and so what might work for me might work for somebody else. But if you work with me as my personal trainer and you listen to what I have to say as well and correct me and teach me, I can probably go and tell five other people. And so from a monetary standpoint, you know, you might get three more clients further down the line, not immediate benefit, but it's about creating that brand around what you're trying to do and your philosophy really with personal training and nutrition. And if that's right, people will come to you. You don't need to go and advertise. Well, it's coming back to that ethos, isn't it? To a certain extent, it's it's. I think within, well, especially within the industry, you see it a little bit more more so now. I think we are, to some degree, a little bit fixated on. Obviously, people have to make a living, but you kind of, and I'm not going to say I'm not saying I'm I'm no different. I think I've had a change in mindset. Obviously, going from the gym environment to going online, obviously, you're trying to keep your head above water. So, money is going to be, to some extent, paramount. Uh, the, the clients, a little bit less so. I think because you're having to work so hard to get new clients, you're working stupid amount of hours having back-to-back -back clients you you kind of see well for like me personally with having a disability i think the most i could do back-to-back -back, i think i did five in a row but your attention span and kind of engagement with client one as opposed to with client five is drastically different because you are i would say engaged alert um, quite chatty with number one. By the time you get to number five, you're quite le quite lethargic. So you you're not giving the same experience to those clients. Whereas I think with going online, you okay. You, in most cases, you're not engaging with the person with their actual training, but say, uh, how are they doing? Um, obviously with actually getting feedback back you are more able to I think treat that person as an individual as opposed to I think in the gym it's very much 
to a certain extent I think the per, the client is treated as a number because it's it's because it's putting a detrimental effect on your your health as well because you, you, you you're to a certain extent um, obviously running on f fumes at times that's that's absolutely right and i think that's where you know it's again about finding that balance right between face to face appointments and online and uh, if you if you have people and if you give them a forum on your website where they can just drop in messages of when and how they're feeling it's it's much more involving than knowing that it's like going to a gp you know you've got 10 minutes at that and you're being <laughs> treated like a number but uh, but if you if you say personal trainer and if you say hey instead of an hour slot you know, we will do a 30 minute session, but you can drop me X amount of messages on, on this number and, you know, we can review this next time around or whatever. Uh, it, it lessens your load and it makes them more engaged with you. And, and then, you know, you are more uh, available for them, even though, you know, you're not seeing them face to face. So, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a balancing act like anything else, really. So, uh, so, yeah, so I think, uh, that is again for you to find really is, is how that works. I think I think you you're right there, Sid. With it's it's the balancing act. I think for me personally, it's helped. I've it's obviously gone from a a small pool because I was based in in Wrexham in in for the gym, and now obviously with the internet, it, well, to a certain extent it's the globe, but it's who chooses to read. The articles, listen to the podcast. I think it's it's it changed my shifted my mindset because I think the tutor I had um, for the online stuff, uh, Declan Doyle, was saying it's out there. If the people don't choose to read it, that's their choice. But it's out there uh, for the foreseeable future, as or until you decide to delete it. So there will come a time. Will somebody will read it? It's it's just putting that content out there, and in most cases, if somebody like you said have the similar issues, if you write about it, somebody else will say, "Oh, I haven't thought. I I didn't think about it. Why don't I try X, Y, and Z?" Yeah, or they might know somebody else who might be facing that problem, and they can recommend that article to them and just retweet and say, "Hey," and tag somebody else and say. Yeah, you know, have have a have a read of this or have a listen of this podcast or whatever. But uh, but I mean, I I find that uh, pretty similar in the type one diabetes community because there is so much going on in terms of different people, different experiences. Everybody shares a lot of stuff. Uh, I do as well uh, on my social media accounts, and uh, the response is varying. But different people react to different kind of stuff because they need different things at different times. So an article that might be useful to five people today in six months time might be useful to 200, but you don't know that. But if you don't put it out there, how will you know? And mm. so I think uh, uh, it's, uh, you have to provide value, right? In, in that sense, if you provide constant value, people will see, okay, he's, he or she is consistent and they're making an effort and what they're sharing is legitimate information, not, you know, Henry Tudor's down said this, so you should do this. There is backing of, proper data and proper, you know, uh, evaluation of that information as well. Uh, and, and, and so I think getting that credibility is hard, but you, uh, it's like anybody else, right? You've got to start somewhere and, 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 and all, like a lot of stuff that you post, I, I, I browse through quickly. And then if something catches my eye, then I'll open that and say, aha, okay. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's totally dependent on the time and day really and how I'm feeling and what I'm looking for. If I am out there looking for an article on different subjects, so you know, some days I'm researching uh, different sports. Some days I'm researching type one diabetes. Some days I'm researching food. It's it, it totally depends on what what I am trying to achieve that day and and uh, and and how and and where my gaps are really. And so knowing what you not don't know is also very good in that respect because then you can specifically go and sort of gain information in that space. Well, it's all about, like you said, it's about it, um, broadening your knowledge base. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, it's it's about also getting to the root cause, as you said earlier, right, in terms of why is it that that is happening or why is it I should listen to this advice instead of anything else. And, uh, 
uh, we, when, when I said earlier about investing in yourself, it's not just monetary, right? It's, it's, it's time and effort as well, because we all have 24 hours only. So you, know, you have to make a concerted effort to open your laptop, to not go on Facebook and go on Google or whatever server you use and type something that you want to search for, find the right kind of link, which is worth reading and then spend the time reading it. And then you might have to spend five hours later, you know, trying to find other opinions and see what's working. But that is where it becomes very taxing on a lot of people. Everybody's very busy. It's a busy lifestyle. So why, why should I read about every single condition in the world? I, I, I don't really need to. And so I will pick and choose what I want to read. So it's, it's not always about throwing money at the problem. It's about time and effort as well. Well, that's a definite one you, you, you raised there, Sid, with um, doing it against like time and effort as opposed to chucking money at a solution. I think when you raised with the trusting your doctor, your uh, obviously the pharmaceutical in, in, uh, industry, I think a lot of people put emphasis on it. Oh, their job is to keep us healthy. But I'm thinking, wow, it is a it is a bit <laughs> it is a business as well. Yes, and and I think once you get diagnosed with something like type one diabetes uh, or similar conditions which are lifelong, and and you figure out, you know, you have a billion dollar or a trillion dollar pharmaceutical industry. Similarly, you have got an industry for processed food. And, 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 and also you've got a billion dollars in a sports drink industry. So you know, just because uh, some pro athlete says Lucozate works for me, does not, you don't need Lucozate as somebody who's going to play badminton for 20 minutes. You know? but, but people do that because of, again, media and advertising and uh, you know, who you follow on social media, they, they can influence quite a lot of your day-to-day -day decisions. And so again, following the right people, I mean, uh, you look at somebody like Jessica Ennis, she always comes across as in an amazing way on, on, on whatever social media forum she's on or on TV, always saying the right things. Uh, Chris Hoy, Bradley Wiggins, Chris Froome, all these people, you know, uh, they, they're trying to adhere to the right kind of so, uh, social media image that they have and the things that they say, they're very particular about it. But, I mean, that's just a handful of athletes. I mean, there are so many on either side. Uh, but... Uh, but I mean, again, it's it's about who you trust and uh, who do you listen to because there are so there's so much out there. Uh, and yeah, pharmaceutical. Uh, we we might need another podcast if you want to talk about <laughs> pharmaceutical industries and, and and my opinion on those. But uh, but yeah, I think we will leave it for later. <laughs> so in in terms of uh, like sports drinks for uh -huh. you for you and say the people with it who've got type one diabetes, how would it differentiate? between a normal individual? So I think it's about how much sugars are in that drink. And so we work in 10 grams, 5 grams of carbs. You know, on the back of the packet, mm. it says 100, you have this, this, and this. So if it says, you know, 15 grams of carbs, of which 10 are sugars. So forget that of which, what sugars. 15 grams of carbs, 20 grams of carbs. So I basically focus on how many carbs there are. And so if even on a normal day, if I'm not exercising and if I, if my blood sugars goes below four mmol per liter, I might need five grams of quick acting sugar to bring it back up again. Uh, and, 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 and similarly during exercising, I have tried a lot of different companies, gels and bars. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently I'm experimenting with something called super starch by a company called generation. You can, and, 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 and how that works is it is providing me with much more stable blood sugars throughout my bike ride than having to consume constant amount of sugar to just keep things up at a level where my legs have energy to give me throughout my bike ride. So this, this whole week that has gone by, I have been experimenting with uh, Generation You Can and their starch pouches really. And it's it's like your uh, any any sort of supplement drink really, but... The way the super starch works, it is not going to give you a massive spike and then a massive crash. It is slow re releasing carbs. So what kind of carbs you're consuming also then becomes a question. Mm. So that gets very complicated very quickly because how, how for example, Lucozade would work or Gatorade would work or Generation U can will work, they're very different. It might say 
you know carbs but what carbs are in it what's what's you know again finding the root cause of, of, of what's going into the thing you know uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 again different people have different strategies so in my team of 22 riders we have riders from new zealand australia canada myself from uk and a lot of people from the us we we all because we are based in such different locations we have our preferential pro- personal products that we mm. use for exercising and and we have some sponsors for this bike event and like one of the sponsors is honey stingers and i've heard that their product is great but i haven't used them yet and so i'm intrigued to see how my body will react to those uh, whereas with generation you can being sponsors we have, we have got their product i was researching about that anyways beforehand and uh, i did make few mistakes up front but having got the knowledge behind how to use it i think i'm getting more confident with it so uh again it you know it's about your insulin dosage it's about understanding uh, glycogen stores it's understanding how your liver works it's understanding how your pancreas is not working and 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 what intensity of exercises you are doing so imagine that those are constant decisions you need to make so if i'm going on a bike ride around huddersfield which is quite hilly i base my carb intake around the intensity that i'm about to go on so if it, if the next kilo, 10 15 kilometers are flattish then i might not consume that many sort of uh, carbs beforehand but if i know it's a 10 kilometer uphill climb then i will try and consume more because i know my body will sort of mm-hmm. consume it at, at a much faster pace so it's it's it, it's again uh, like i use uh, insulin pens uh, like like this one a lot of uh, type 1 diabetics also use pumps where they can manage the dose of insulin at a very small level and 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 they can shut it off switch it on but for me using pens once i inject that's going to stay in my body for 12 or 24 hours or if it's a quick acting insulin it is going to stay for 4 hours so think about the preparation that goes into it every day like i took an injection at 7 knowing that i'm going to go out cycling tomorrow morning and if it rains my blood sugar might uh, if i don't go out if it's too windy then i need to probably take some quick acting because my blood sugar might rise and so on and so forth so uh, decisions and and planning becomes a critical part of doing sports or in general just living with type 1 diabetes really that's that's quite interesting i i i raise obviously it's i think the the normal individual uh kind of doesn't have to think when they go to the shop you just pick if you've got say type 1 diabetes uh any kind of allergies and things like that they you've got to think whereas i i've had a uh, client say to me um or just individuals that are curious to to just improve their health say well what will this say stage will say i had a challenge got a couple of weeks ago uh where a, a lot of them predominantly we say there's a couple with amputees with type 1 diabetes so obviously I've never dealt, had to deal with type 1 diabetes so I said well I did my research to say well what what will the, what will ketosis do to somebody on diabetes so obviously I went away and googled it well I I now now know the the warning signs that somebody that that's got it has to look out for so i sent him that information to obviously that's for his peace of mind uh obviously he's, he i think was, wait did he lose i think it was about about four four pound at the halfway mark so he, he can he lost a, a lot of weight okay w- would that have been water weight or actual body fat i don't know obviously it was early days it pr- possibly some of it might be but you can kind of see obviously that works i wouldn't say do it long term but as you can t- attest to you've gone from ketosis on to um and gone to, to uh, i can't speak uh ketogenesis phase which is obviously prolonging it a little bit more and it's worked for you okay like we were saying earlier in the podcast that precursor might not work for him it might do so obviously it's yeah. it's kind of playing around with your diet so to speak yeah and 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 there are pretty similar sounding words so dka 
ketoacidosis is very different to ketosis is very different to nutritional ketosis right so they sound very similar if you are type 1 diabetic and you are in dka you probably don't want to you don't, don't want to, that. you don't want to go anywhere near that but you can be a type 1 diabetic or a normal person and be in nutritional ketosis right if my if for a normal person the blood sugars don't go above 6 mmol per liter let's say but for a type 1 diabetic if somebody's pump stops or they forget to take insulin or whatever and it rises up to 13 or 14 that can cause a lot of problems but uh, that's the risk worth understanding hence knowledge is key is understanding when you are in nutritional ketosis or when you are in dka what the symptoms are what to do if you are in either of those and then see which way do you want to go and again i have been doing this for last 6 months so i am not an expert in long term effects of nutritional ketosis uh positive or negative as i said i am living breathing experiment on my own so maybe in a years or two years time if we do another podcast and say hey how have you got on are you still in ketosis or whatever you are doing we might have more evidence but there are other people who have been doing this for 10 15 20 years i know people on social media there is a youtube channel called low carb down under where you have a lot of uh, uh, athletes uh, physiotherapists doctors engineers uh, people living with type 1 diabetes coming and sharing their experiences and all their data and, and and looking at a lot of them that kind of gives me a lot of confidence in the space i am at and a few weeks ago i attended a conference online Uh, it it was a low carb break conference in the US uh, in Colorado and i got, bought like their online pass to see live footage of the of the talks and and again because i wanted to learn about it and some of the stuff that they talked about gave me more confidence in terms of the research that has already been done what's happening today and what the possibilities might be in the future and uh, you know things like mcdonalds and kfc didn't Uh, you know didn't just appear yesterday i mean they have not been going on forever so 500 a thousand years ago there was no mcdonald's no mm-hmm. kfc but people were living and they were healthy and uh, they they probably had less issues than we do in our generation so you know if if thousands and thousands of years of humans survived without all the junk food and processed food um maybe that's something worth considering you know we forget the history we just look at the short term view and say oh my god you know these companies are making such amazing burgers let's go for it or whatever <laughs> but you know if you talk to my grandfather he doesn't know what mcdonald's is right he he is a farmer he he has his own farm he has his own cows and they get their own milk they grow their own veggies and 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 he has less issues in his 70s and 80s the night <laughs> i've already racked up in my 20s so it's uh, it, a bit of context also helps right because sometimes people can get too disillusioned with just numbers and 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 just looking at data and not realizing what the context of those numbers is and 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 i think that's very important because uh, otherwise you can just get too much fixed by just the numbers and have a counterproductive effect on your health and on your mental health and on your management of your any condition that you have so yeah but i think you raise a good point there to to, to kind of at the end is obviously about numbers obviously with you doing a university degree you can attest to as like myself we're going to university uh it's very much almost like manipulative but you can kind of make data go whatever way you suit you so it's it's i think the better ones i think the best better studies are the ones that can kind of say where things went went wrong as well like the limitations as to well this study said this this that so say we'll say for example um it showed that people lost weight but this the limitations were uh because the nutrition wasn't pinpoint they were actually in a deficit so they didn't actually do as well as they could have so it's kind of the the research also draws on its flaws as well as the positives yeah but i think a lot of people don't do that and i always say the, i've got the saying that numbers don't lie people do and so that kind of works in that context is yes 
you can be funded by a specific company to do that research and you can create a hypothesis to just prove it using this kind of experiment you set up to come to that conclusion because that's what you're being asked come to this conclusion you know and then write about it and we'll get it published and 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 and, and that's where it's a it's a fine line between getting too cynical about these things and 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 getting some perspective so that's why getting different opinions is 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 actually a good way to go about it and read contradicting information and and see what is presenting it's like going to a debating competition in school you have somebody for the topic and somebody against the topic and you listen to both and then you decide which way mm. you want to go and we don't have that in today's uh, sort of um, news and 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 marketing at the moment it's 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 all just yeah do this and that's okay that's it but uh, i would love to see more debates like that where you have somebody speaking for a topic somebody against and both bringing numbers facts evidence case studies to say okay i am saying this because of these things and somebody saying i'm saying against that because of these things and then you as an individual can decide with your knowledge which way do you want to go but uh, unfortunately that's not a common uh, sight in today's culture really i think i think the only example you'd have that would if you say if you use the soft drinks industry as the example obviously the, the studies that support it are yeah. funded by them and obviously yeah. looking at the downsides of having so much sugar are generally not supported by them so that's the only example i can think of where you would kind of see the difference so it's if you can have that in the back of your mind well okay this this says sugar is not as bad for me as the status quo okay well what what is the kind of underlying factor as to why the that data is saying that and it'd be the same with you could probably say with smoking it's okay now now the evidence is so much uh there that against it that it's, it's got no just, leg to stand you on you can't stop them from smoking even with all the evidence there are thousands and thousands of people who still smoke it's their choice that they are making right so even even with all the right information at the end of the day you still have to make a choice mm-hmm. and, and 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 so uh you know decisions kind of shape your destiny in some way and you can have all the research in the world but you can't make me play ice hockey because <laughs> i don't i don't want to for example right that, that's just a random example so if somebody wants to smoke you know uh, somebody said to uh, one of my colleagues uh, how long have you been smoking and he said 20 or 30 years and they said oh how much was the is each packet of cigarette and said this much oh so if you haven't been smoking for 30 years then you could have uh, bought yourself a ferrari and he just turned around and said so where is yours <laughs> <laughs> perfect you know so so you can't force anybody to do anything uh, they have to make a conscious choice of wanting to invest their time into do, into something and uh, i think that's what it boils down to is even with all the good intentions with all the good research with all all the good social media people still at the end of the day have to decide to do something or not to do something and that's where it comes back to us as individuals owning our body from a health perspective but also standing up and making our own decisions really so said i'll ask you this question what obviously with the sugar tax mm-hmm. i think it's come into effect now anyway or it will be coming in in the near future in the uk what is your take on it i think uh, it's it's a deterrent but it's like having asking people to pay 5p for a plastic bag in in Sainsbury's and Tesco's you know they're just making money off it people are still buying plastic bags and 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 and, and it's 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 weird because i mean i saw so many people who are type 1 diabetic go absolutely crazy on uh, social media when they said lucozade is going to reduce its uh, sugar content by 10% of 20% because they use that as treatment for going low and so they think oh i need to drink a lot more to recover from a low blood sugar event but i think for general population you know like we're talking 50% of the time it might work so for that 50% if you 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 if you go and ask those 50% what should be your daily sugar intake 
they don't know. What should be your daily carb intake? They don't know. So if you can reduce a bit and help reduce the overall weight of the population and and, and guide them towards something better, I, I, I've got no issues with that. But again, you can't enforce that on people, really. Uh, there has to be a lot more education around that as well. Why are you taxing it? What are the benefits? So you can't just put it out without providing the education and the detail. And I think that's where we might miss a trick is... Uh, just put it out in, in the open and say, okay, this is what it is today. You know, nobody has come up and shown me the evidence of, in the last year, how many plastic bags have we not sold because of that 5P uh, in, you know, increment on it, and how much environmental benefit has that had. I don't know, but I still have to pay 5P every time I want to go to <laughs> Sainsbury's or Tesco to buy something. And I don't forget to take my bag. So yeah, I think it's 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 weird that one. Oh, but that argument you bring up with the plastic bags, it's uh, I think my mum brings up a good point with this one. Shouldn't the supermarket pay you because you're advertising it? Yeah, or have an alternative. Like in in India, in a lot of cities, they have completely banned banned plastic bags. So people have cloth bags and other alternatives that that they offer you the stuff that you're buying in. So. Where is the alternative? You know, they say, okay, 5p bag or 10p bag or, or here's a 5 pound bag. And, and most of the people will forget stuff in their car or at home and they realize when they enter the supermarket, damn, I forgot my bags again. So it's again, can, can I have three, ba- <laughs> three 5p bags, please, or whatever. But uh, yeah, your mom's absolutely right. And I will add to that and say, where are the alternatives? You can't just implement something without offering other alternatives which are better. I think the Americans have got it right because they give you a choice between paper and plastic. So they've got the paper option is maybe a little bit better because you can you could reuse it, but obviously it's not as uh, what would be the word I want um, as strong as a plastic bag. Yeah. Again, there are pros and cons of all of these things. I mean, uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, sugar intake in today's population is way way above what it should be. And for a lot of people, again, until you get hit by a health condition or you put on too much weight or something happens, you know, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, kind of thing. Then you, know, you have two spoons of sh- of sugar with your cup of tea in the morning, maybe a spoon in the afternoon, and a cake with a friend in, in a coffee shop, and and, and 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 a dessert with your dinner. The amount of sugar in that one day is 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 a lot of sugar, and depending on how your body is processing it, how insulin sensitive or resistant you are, uh, that's why type two diabetes is becoming an epidemic mm. because people's bodies just are shutting down, and 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 the, the response. You know, we talk about listening to your body as an athlete. Uh, if if you're gaining that much weight that your body isn't giving you those signals back, that's a very, very bad place to be in. But again, it's an ecosystem. You can't just do one thing and expect everything else to fall in place. They have to educate more about vitamins, minerals, carbs, protein, and talk about sugar as well. Uh, but yeah, demonizing sugar at the moment uh, seems to be the in thing. So yeah, <laughs> let's see how that goes. No, but I think like you like you raised that valid point. With it for you, it's sugar and insulin is a very uh, it's kind of a life or death situation. But for a normal individual, like you said, um, they don't actually know how much they're intaking. I think what is it? I was reading. It was meant to be ten percent of your daily intake, and I think they've lowered it to five percent now. But there's a difference between actual sugars. There's what is it? Um, free sugar and intrin- intrinsic. And I didn't know the difference between it. And I, <laughs> and I'm quite health conscious. And you thinking, well, somebody that's quite fit doesn't know the difference. And I think it's. Uh, the free sugars is obviously the bad one, the the bad ones, and the intrinsic is fruit, like sugars you get from fruit, vegetables, but they get de- uh, and kind of other things like soups are getting demonized because it's got sugar. But the labeling doesn't, like you were saying, it doesn't actually break it down to another level and make it a little bit more okay, more complex to well this is carbohydrate it consists of sugar but then there's multitudes of levels of what constitutes sugar 
Yeah, but you've got things like on, on, on energy bars and gels, inverted maple syrup and, 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 and other stuff like that. And you're thinking, where the hell does inverted maple syrup grow? It's, it's, it's surely been made in a lab to mm. make it taste better or something <laughs> like that. And, and, and forget fructose and, uh, you know, uh, fructose and sucrose. Uh, I, when I start reading some of the labels, I just immediately put them back going, oh my God, I don't know half the ingredients. So, <laughs> and they don't, they're not naturally existing ingredients either. So, uh, again, it's, it, it's, when you start paying attention to these things, it, you think to yourself, oh my God, this is common sense. Why haven't been, why haven't I been paying more attention earlier? But there has to be a trigger, whether it's your own consciousness going, I need to live a healthy life or uh, getting a condition like type 1 diabetes or, or, or any side of sort, sort of an episode in your life that wants you to be more healthy. And, and again, it's your choice or your decisions. You can go and pick up something that's processed meat or you can go and get some fresh cut meat. You can buy biscuits that are absolutely filled with a lot of other stuff or you can make your own healthy biscuits at home knowing exactly what's going in but uh, again not everybody has the time or the effort that goes into doing those things so you have to invest in 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 that mindset and i think to you know bring it back full circle that's what we said in the beginning right uh, about it's not a four week or five week fix it's a lifestyle choice and and, and i think that's a solid note to put at the end is uh, make it a lifestyle choice because it makes it more sustainable and easy to manage and you know exactly what you want to do and what you don't want to do and what those things are are different for everybody but uh, yeah test it out make some mistakes and uh, i'm still here telling my tale so yeah you can't go too wrong really <laughs> so one last question for you said before we wrap up the podcast um if you had to summarize this entire podcast into one sentence, what would that be? One size does not fit all. Embrace it. I think that's a, that's a quote to, to live by for everybody. So, once again, Sid, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me, James. It's been a pleasure. So, for everybody else, this podcast will be aired every week. So, until next week, I will see you guys then. Take care.